Hey everyone, Sean and Dave here from Saturday Morning Cartoons. We cannot start this week's show, absolutely cannot start this week's show, until we thank the following people who went to Patreon.com to sponsor this show. Derek Haynes. Alex Kazanis. Jack Connolly. Jonathan Renteria Elie. Bill Dixon. The wonderful Melanie Harker. Dr. Jason Woods. Oh, the fantastic Allison Keene. The all right Jamal Newman. The so-so John Helter. Battle Matt Fitness. The wonderful David Trumbor. And the one and only Sean Paul Ellis. Hey, out there, if you guys want to be on this list or just want to know what's coming up next week on the show, check out patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons for more details. And remember, that's morning with a U. Thank you so much for sponsoring us. Thank you so much for listening. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the weekly podcast that revisits, reviews, and ridicules some of the world's weirdest animated series. Coming to you from Agrabah by way of Duckburg, I'll be your co-host, Dave Trumbor. Joining me as always, our very own Arabian Knight, it's Sean Paul Ellis. <laughs> How's it going there, sir? Uh, David, 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 I'm doing well, buddy. How about yourself? I say sir because it is now sir. Sean Paul Ellis. Oh, Congratulations man. on the promotion to Arabian Night. Yeah, weirdly enough, it's only uh, represented and only acknowledged when I'm in Agrabah, which is, honestly, these days, not very often. Yeah, it's pretty specific. Yeah. I feel like that's some restricted areas. It's not days. It's not a title that travels well. <laughs> the Arabian Night title doesn't travel well for you? <laughs> yeah, surprisingly as much. does not travel well for a white redhead. It is rough going through customs, I would imagine. Uh, but you know what? The best thing about going through customs is going through customs with somebody else, which is why for this final week's episode for our Disney March Madness, we have invited friend and guest of the show, entertainer and performer from Washington, D.C., Melanie Harker. Welcome back. I don't get any kind of characterization today. I don't get to be like... You're straight person on the show. Oh. We get to be the I don't get to be like the cool... Pet friend. I mean, that's that's actually fair because last week, uh, Dr. Allison Keene was our special guest as gummy berry juice expert and chemist. Mm. See, I don't get fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> what are we like? Two minutes in? You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. What's hey your guys. What's your specialty again? Like in life or personally? No, I mean, like oh. for the sake of this show. Yeah. yeah. Let's just keep it localized. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'm an expert in the elements and uh, mythology around the elements. Wow, interesting. Uh, and you do a lot of uh, you do a lot of work with birds. Yeah, which is in part why we brought you on this week's episode. A lot of mm-hmm. avian oh, yeah, research. There's a lot of avian cross yeah. avian cultural anthropological research around mm. aviaries. Definitely around the aviaries. Yeah, you feel better now. I feel so much more valued. Please Why welcome to the show Melanie Harker, our ornithologist elementalist specialist. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Dave and Sean. It's it's a real pleasure. It is it is actually our pleasure because the pair of cartoons we are talking about tonight, the last night, thank the Agrabah gods uh, of Disney March Madness. What? What do you mean? I, don't, I can't take anymore. Uh. I can't do it. <laughs> too many, too much math. Too much math. Too I much thought math. you were going to say. Too much non buttholes on animals, which is what well, Disney's I mean, known for. A, that's just a constant, unfortunately. I'm sure you come across that a lot in your line of work. I sure do. I sure yeah. do, Dave. So really quick, I want to bring up the point. Is the thing that's holding us back from doing March Disney Madness, aside mm-hmm. from the calendar, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> is it the fact that you're scared of math, that you don't want to do any more math moving forward into April? No, I think I'm just, uh, I'm actually okay with this. We had, a, we had a good run the last, this week we have good cartoons to talk about. Last week we had good cartoons to talk about. But we're kind of like, we're four for eight, I guess, my personal opinion. The, mm. the early part of the month was, was rough. Yeah, of course. And honestly, there's just so much Disney you can take, right? Some people out there are just like Disney all the time, watch it every day, gotta have my Disney. Uh, I'm not one of those people. It, it's like it gets to a point where it's just like it's, it's like having too much sugar in a day, just too sweet, too wholesome, too many sexual innuendos veiled and hidden behind the scenes, mm-hmm. uh, too much casual racism. Apparently, as we'll talk about today. <laughs> yeah, but it's great in their classics. Um, sometimes it's just like I need like a devil may cry or a um, 
was it? No, Devil Man Crybaby. I need a Devil Man Crybaby in my life after you watching. Mean, you mean you mean Devil Man Crybaby? Yeah, that's what I just said. You said Devil May Cry, that's baby. That's what you said before, and then I changed it to Devil Man <laughs> Crybaby. This is what I'm saying. Too much Disney rots oh, the brain. Man. So if people are Take it listening, from me. I'm a doctor. <laughs> If people are listening in for the first time and you're unfamiliar with our Disney March Madness. Oh, God, make, I'm sorry. Let's make it very, very simple for you yep. for coming in for the final week of this. You have three weeks that you can catch up beyond this episode. But for those who are unfamiliar with the process, we have pit eight, eight cartoons against each other uh, that are all Disney related. They all were either on the Disney Channel or on actual like uh, Saturday mornings or afternoon cartoons. And what we did in order to standardize all of this is that everybody watched the first pilot episode of each one of these. We are going to be grading these across five categories that we have tonight. Uh, and if you're playing at home, we would love to have your score. Feel free to tweet or send us a message and let us know. We are going to be critical of their theme song, animation style, characters, plot, and then finally our potpourri grab bag that we have is how Disney is it? Because we couldn't think of anything else that would be crazier than having to subjectively qualify something as being Disney other than a cash grab. Until we have a Saturday morning cartoons trivial pursuit game made after us. <laughs> and those are the puzzle pieces you have to get. And I'm 100% sure I've made this terrible joke on this, this month of March Madness <laughs> before. So I apologize. But also, where's our trivial pursuit game? Yeah, come on. Where's this trivial pursuit? Who do we have to beat in a game of Trivial Pursuit in order to get our own Trivial Pursuit game? That's how Ken Trivial Jennings. Pursuit works. Ken Jennings. Oh, I was going to say Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Probably. I don't, know. I don't know why, but... Yeah, they do a weird tag team for it. It's tough. Speaking of tag teams, we're going to be going round robin today to talk about all five of these categories. But before we get into that, if somehow you're listening to this very niche podcast and you have missed the cartoons that we're talking about today... Sean and myself are going to walk you through them a little bit. So what are we starting with today, Sean? Oh, man. Tonight, we are starting with Aladdin. And if you're unfamiliar with Aladdin, here's some history. It is a multi-Emmy award-winning American animated television series that aired from September of 1994 to November of 1995, based on the original 1992 Disney film of the same name. What? A total of... 86 episodes were produced, so we have very clearly hit that 65-episode mark with all of this. A direct-to-video film, Aladdin and the King of Thieves, arrived after the series ended. The series was produced by Alan Laslov and Tad Stone, who were already renowned for their work on Chippendale's Rescue Rangers and Darkwing Duck. Many of the film's stars provided the voices of their TV counterparts, with notable exceptions of Dan Castellaneta, filling in for Robin Williams in the genie role, like in The Return of Jafar. And Val Benton as the Sultan, who replaced Douglas Seal after the original film. Unlike The Little Mermaid, the series does not feature any musical numbers, which is a real shame. Is it, though? Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, they can only write so many. Alan Menken and that other guy are super busy. Oh, God. <laughs> the series originally aired as a preview on the Disney Channel in early 1994, and in September, it began airing concurrently. The series originally aired as a preview on the Disney Channel in early 1994, and in September, it began airing concurrently on the syndicated The Disney Afternoon Block and on Saturday mornings on CBS prior to the Disney purchase of rival ABC. Disney Channel re-ran the series from 1997 until 2000 when it was replaced by the pre-teen lineup, which I can only assume is probably what, like, Quack Pack, but with Aladdin? I guess, unless yeah. they're talking about, like, live action stuff, either yeah, way. It's like Aladdin Never Extreme. Again. Aladdin Extreme. Yeah. Uh, the, the show was then shown on Toon Disney from April of 1998 until, wow, 2009, yeah. when, when it and the rest of the lineup was replaced by the brand new Disney XD branding. Now, that was a lot of history. It's a lot more than we usually get into. But the last few weeks, we've kind of been wondering, like, what is the timeline for all of these shows that we're talking about? How close are they to each other uh, in time? And then we, you know, we're, we're all around the same age, and most of our listeners out there probably are too. But it's like, sometimes you know you didn't have Disney growing up. And you know you only got that one preview weekend, like, <laughs> once or twice a year. So there's no way you could have watched all those. Well, looking at you, Allison Keen. Yeah. So it's like, where did we watch these shows? So we dug a little deeper for this one and found when Aladdin was on syndication and where. So the fact that this was on normal broadcast, you could honestly pick it up over a satellite if you had that back in there. Uh, radar, you know, like 
just a regular TV antenna kind of thing back like in the, the day. rabbit ears. Yeah, rabbit ears. Yeah. I don't know why I went satellite and radar. Too. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I of... have that, but if you well, had your own or... cell tower, you could have easily watched Disney Weekend. If you oh had your God. own nuclear submarine back in 1994, you could watch Aladdin, no problem. But uh, yeah, we wanted to include that because it was kind of like just trying to figure out where and when we watch this stuff. Absolutely. But hey, guess what? If you guys don't know what Aladdin's about, shame on you. <laughs> go watch the movie first. What are you doing here? <laughs> But this is interesting because it's actually sandwiched between, I think, The Return of Jafar, which was, what, the sequel to the original Aladdin. And then this picks up where that left off, if I've got my timing right. So this particular series is set after Return of Jafar, if I've got that right. And I have to say, spoiler alert, because this picks up after Jafar's death. And in this series, Aladdin continues his duty as the savior of Agrabah. Yes, you're totally right. It serves as the first episode, sorry, the technically, okay. of the animated series. Uh, Aladdin and his friends continue their adventures, exploring the world and protecting the city from various groups of villains. Here's the fun part. Aladdin featured right. such pontastic names as, now stick with me here, Abis Mal, How Rude Has He Been, Amin Damula, Ayam Agul, Ajed al Jabraic, Nefer Hassanaf, Here's my favorite. Salta, Sultan Pasta al Dente. Oh. You weren't even trying with that one. Oh, my God. Yeah. And then, uh, fortunately, Mosenrath, which is yeah. actually a pretty badass name. So I like Mosenrath. Yeah. Uh, voiced by Jonathan no. Brandis. How Shut the fuck up. It's like Mozzarella Wrath. It's like a real angry yeah, a great name. guy. Which is weird because Mosenrath is just spelled like mozzarella. <laughs> which I'm also fine with. But let me ask you guys this <laughs> quick villain. before we get into it tonight, because we only got to, we only got introduced to maybe two of these really terribly named characters. Did you remember them being as like punny, but also like racially insensitive <laughs> as they clearly were? Not at all. I wasn't old enough to form those kinds of memories, so I really don't remember them at all. No, I mean, I, I, I definitely had watched some Aladdin on television but I do not remember the puns and I do not remember the insensitivity that they had in this at all. No. Nope. The only names I think I remember were Mosenrath and then I remembered Abbas Mall really? when I heard it. Because it's I, Jason Alexander? Yeah, definitely with his voice you connect to it. But like Abbas Mall, I was like, oh, I remember that guy and his, his character design and everything. But I don't think I really connected the fact that they were like making up fake Middle Eastern names into puns at the same time. Which... I don't know. Where do you guys fall on that? Because you can do that with American names. Look at all the crazy, like, early 80s shows that we watch. Go back to, like, what was the one with the monster trucks? Oh, the monster sure. Machines Big, or whatever they Bigfoot were. and the Muscle Machines. Yeah, Bigfoot oh, yeah. and the Muscle Machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, you know, look at the Sectors or look at the Sky Commanders. Like, all those names are just terrible. But it's kind of, like, more acceptable because they're just, like, eh. Just kind of American names, like Jake Rockwell or Ace McCloud. And it's like, that's fine. But... Ace McCloud little... is dumb, though. Yeah, hey, whoa, 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 whoa! Let's see, don't don't <laughs> salt the centurion. All right, <laughs> that's a, that's that's big deal here in this house, it's holy ground, this cartoon house. I think in this house we celebrate Ace McCloud. <laughs> I think in terms of the pun, the pun level of the names, yeah. I think it, it it indicates the larger problem that this series has, which is it mm. leans too heavily. On the puns, if there were a band of thieves and they all had like they don't need a they don't need first and last names like who gives a crap just name them like whatever names or don't name them at all it doesn't really make a big difference. Um, but then on top of that, like each one of them has to be a pun like that's a little much. You know what I mean? Like you could have just stopped at one. I'll also say this, like you know, looking at some of these names like Abismal or mm-hmm. like Nafir has enough. It's not like they have names for like American counterparts where they're just like, Steve stole stuff. And you're like, huh, yeah. oh, that's interesting. Like none of our names are like maybe considered like uh, like one of the seven deadly sins or like a, like a, a possible like reason to be incarcerated. What's, what's a good- Or just like a shitty attitude. Nobody's name like Robert is a dick. Well, <laughs> that's actually a pretty good yeah. card. Well, like, <laughs> what are the names of the, the bad guys in like Ninja Turtles? What are those two? Shredder, guys? Krang, Bebop, Rocksteady. Yeah, Rat King, Baxter Stockman. I can keep going. Yeah, but I mean, like He Man ones are probably pretty bad, but they're also like alien weirdo Stella creatures. Yeah, they're not like, real people. They don't align with any particular race, gender, or anything. I'm trying to think um, of what else would be like. I'm trying to think too. I can't example. think of anything that's just like some are just like stupid and just punny, but not downright like you know Doc Terror 
or something from uh what what were the ones from um <laughs> like bots master or cops even cops there's a great example right cops you had names like uh well it was like big boss sure okay um misdemeanor <laughs> right yeah i mean I, I can see that like we've got a lot of these people had like had actual first and last names but then they had like a code name that they used when they were a part of cops like <laughs> long arm exactly bulletproof yeah. uh bowser i don't know that this is mario reference yeah. sundown mirage maze highway barricade hardtop but those are just like those are just words they looked up in a dictionary yeah. Yeah, yeah, or like in, in like a police handbook. Like they didn't they're... lean into traditional Middle Eastern names and then like yeah. make a pun off their last name. So right. and they're like, like we wow, had... this is some cool area to mine for like really terrible puns. It would be like okay, say in like the I don't know fifties, you had you had and you definitely did. You had cartoon characters who were going up against. Uh, villains in quotations of like Asian persuasions, and then you decided to make them all pun, punny Asian names, yeah. punny Chinese or Japanese or Korean names. It's that level now. Like it, the puns, they're not super funny to begin with. I'm fine with abysmal, but that's about as far as I go. <laughs> the rest of them are just like, oh boy. But I think, especially it, when you get to, like pasta al dente, like you're not even. Yeah, I think I think the hard good. contrast with this is just the Mosin Wrath is so great, yeah. and it's such a wonderful name. It's like. They could have easily figured some things out. And it's not like they right. didn't have a creative team that was behind them that could have put these things together and, and right. put them and integrated them into the show. But they were like, no, nope, no. Nope. Somebody on the somebody on the writing staff was like, guys, I'm really good with puns. And like, Ugh, all right, Derek, go off and do your this thing. Is, yeah. And it is Derek, because it's just a bunch Fucking of like white uncles Derek. in a room that are just all laughing at the puns that they're coming up with. Or just like they're like, Oh, we used to call this guy such and such. And it's like, Ugh, all right. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to think about that. Yeah. Uh, hey. That's why I wanted to get it out of the way so it didn't distract later <laughs> fair, in the discussion. Fair yeah, enough. Fair. But something that's not going to distract and something that's going to be increasingly <laughs> exciting is the fact that this is Aladdin versus DuckTales tonight. What a pair. Yes. Woo. And so if you are not familiar with DuckTales, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Every week I've been like, you need to stop this show and go watch it immediately. But DuckTales is an American animated television series that premiered in September of 1987 and ran for a total of 100 episodes over four seasons with its final episode airing November 28th of 1990. DuckTales has received a franchise of merchandise, including video games, which are awesome, and they remastered it, comic mm -hmm. books, which I read as a kid, along with the animated theatrical spin-off film entitled DuckTales the Movie, Treasure of the Lost Lamp, which was released in theaters August of 1990. The series is notable for being the first Disney cartoon to be produced for weekday syndication, with its success paving the way for future cartoons such as Chippendale Rescue Rangers and Tailspin. So, DuckTales is pretty much the OG of yeah. all of this. The show's popular theme song was written by Mark Mueller. Good job, Mark Mueller. Yeah, nailed it. Yeah. Sean Absolutely. is so in love that he's wearing his DuckTales shirt right Aww. now. That's so sweet. <laughs> he like, I didn't even Accurate. know, and then Accurate. he like pulled it off when we were making dinner. I was like, Jesus, biased yeah. much? Dat bod. Dat bod. Oh, you mean the DuckTales Yeah, the shirt. DuckTales no. shirt. Uh, but also Dat bod. Come on. Yeah, Friend of the show, Melanie Harker, Dapod. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? But I, you know, I, I will say obviously there there is a little bit, bit of a clear bias going into tonight. But I mm. loved, I loved Disney's Aladdin, the theatrical yeah. movie. Yeah. And and, and oh, we'll definitely get into. And it. so like I, there, there was so much love and excitement, and I even and the video game. Yeah, and the, and video, the video game, game. the, the Sega Genesis, the Sega Genesis mm -hmm. game was hard as hell, but that was yeah. so yeah. much fun. And I have like I have really strong memories of playing that with my cousin on the Cape over summers, and so uh, I I love both of these a lot. Sean said that with a pipe in his he mouth. He sure by the way. did. Oh my God, out. guys! I have fun. On memory. the Cape. I can't help where my family, where members like of Liverpool. my family live. In the country club. Just like I could propped up on servants. I couldn't help playing with wet cardboard boxes as a child, but I turned out fine. So, well, that took a real. Dark. I, I I skew more towards Mel's side of the spectrum. <laughs> High five! <laughs> yeah, wet cardboard kid. Yeah. Oh my god! Uh, but if no, you that was that was yeah yeah. <laughs> Indeed, guys. If hey, you if what? you don't know about Ducktales, Dave, give I'm us a little bit I'm of a synopsis. Lay it on you. Yeah, you might not actually remember Ducktales the way you think you do because I definitely didn't. There was a lot more kind of adventurous aspect to it earlier in the telling before it got kind of populated with 
a bunch more side characters and became kind of this like ensemble animated comedy. So back in the early days, DuckTales was based on Uncle Scrooge and other Duck Universe comic books created by Carl Barks. This show follows Scrooge McDuck and his three grandnephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and their friends on various adventures, most of which either involve seeking out treasure or thwarting the efforts of villains seeking to steal Scrooge's fortune for his number one dime. Yeah, so that's it. So are you guys ready to jump into theme songs tonight? Let's fucking yeah. do it. Yeah. All right. Well, Mel, we're going to turn to you first. Okay. And tonight we're going to start with Aladdin. I feel like Aladdin's kind of like the underdog coming in, so we're going to always turn to them first. Sounds so good. So the Aladdin theme song. I got some thoughts, but I'm gonna, I want to know what you have to say. So as we kind of men- as Sean kind of mentioned, Aladdin, like... My one of my favorite Disney movies was the first movie I had ever seen in theaters. And while we were listen, we were watching the show, I was like, OK, so the theme song is pretty much what they play in the movie. But I was like, I bet they're not the same. And I, I had this feeling about it because of the way that the theme song drives. It's very like push, 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 push. And now it's done. Here's the show. So because they so they sing for the theme song, it's Arabian Nights. And so if you listen back to the movie and that opening scene with Arabian Nights, because that's how I remember it, it is like moving. It is exciting. It's sung very well. It's like really enchanting. And then the graphics are really beautiful. Here it's like, Oh, we slap together a couple of cuts of some shit here and there, and then we like just stitched it all together. And uh, here you go, kids. It's kind of like Aladdin, but not. And here's your show, dummies. Take it or leave it. <laughs> so, and the tone doesn't match at all what the show is about. Like, I'll get into it later, but the show leans very heavily into that like slapstick comedy, while the movie did a really nice job of like balancing moments of like serious mystique and conversation with like jokes and things like they were you know it was well balanced as a piece of mo- as a movie as a piece of film and the show is like you got 20 minutes under 20 minutes to like hit yeah. your point get out and this theme song like makes it seem like it just doesn't it's too heavy even though it's pushing it's like try it's like we'll try to do it at halftime to see if we can get us there <laughs> it's very weird. I, I I will take you to task when we get closer to the plot about there are some like rather tender moments that they have that are in the show. So it's interesting to see that. But I get I get your point. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I and I'll explain to you in a couple moments why you're wrong. No. Oh my god, <laughs> this kidding. is the theme of the show. Ladies and, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, notice I stayed very far out of that company. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you're playing I'm along at home. I suggest you do the same. No, I, I I agree with I agree with Melanie on on just about every point that she's made, uh, except for where I'm wrong. I, I'm just about the I I think that you're right that they don't do a good job of balancing everything in terms of like tender, honest moments. But there is one that's in there that's notable. But I think it really goes over uh, like a fart in church. Like it's just kind of like. Because because Aladdin puts that person in that situation in the beginning, and so it kind of diminishes the whole. Talking about the theme song. I, I know, I know, but you you, you mentioned task, this. So. so I just want to say uh, this is a, a clip based theme song yeah. where they are reusing animation that they have from all these different episodes. Uh, it is much faster, as Melanie was mentioning, uh, which is really funny because when we watched the actual original intro it's only 18 seconds longer than this theme song and so i don't understand you know we've talked about the laziness with timon and pumbaa this month about being able to lift and shift and like what what the hell was another 18 seconds for them it's i mean it's not like they could have insulted uh, a region of the area with another punny name or they would have missed out on that opportunity during that time um yeah probably money seconds of animation probably money uh, who knows how many hundreds but they also could have picked any other song that is like more a beat from Aladdin. Sure, they could have picked anything. Uh, you know, the I think it's hard because like Melanie was saying, and I, I agree with her, like the original sells you on this mood. It's almost like a prelude or like an opening number for like a musical. Like there's a lot of wonder and excitement. And when you see this, it's just like action, action, action. We almost, yep. did we cut off a booze head? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it just, a clip, yeah. Yeah, it just, it, 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 it was, it was, it was fine, but it really felt like, a lift and shift like a just kind of like they took something that they had and they were like just speed it up so it gets under the minute mark because that's what we got and let's just shove it out there yeah Yeah, for me i think it's real simple they knew that the opening of they obviously aladdin was huge super successful 
and the fact that this series came after its sequel <laughs> was, just shows how successful it was. So they were like, you know what? We're just going to connect it to that original movie that everybody loved, and we're just going to do that. I really think that that's all it was. It's just like, we've got this song. Just cut it down and use it. Now, for me, it's good, but it's only as memorable because the movie used it originally. That's it. It doesn't really stand on its own merit. And I used this argument before for, as Sean mentioned, Timon and Pumbaa. However, here's where the change comes in tonight. I'm going to retroactively change <gasps> my Timon and Pumbaa ranking. What? From a one for the theme song to a four. Oh. Okay. Generous. So it got bonus points. All right. Um, spoiler alert, it does not change the ultimate ranking <laughs> at all. <laughs> but uh, it does align more with what I've determined my score for Aladdin because Bonkers is still a theme song that actively drove me away from ever watching that show. And there's no way that that should score higher than a theme song that is neutral at best. Um, so Bonkers is still my lowest. I gave Aladdin a four and I'm going to give um, Timon and Pumbaa a four as well. Mel, okay. what did you score this one? I gave this guy a three. Okay. I think that's fair. Cause I'm I real still... curious about Sean, though. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look. Uh oh, I give this a seven. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. See, now that's no, no, no. Out. That's what I figured. That's what I figured because he did the same thing for like Timon and Pumbaa. I think he gave it a ten. I don't even know. But I, Timon I, I and Pumbaa Timon... is a. But that's a great song. They took a but, good song and they made it bad. I don't want to argue I, anymore. But no, that's that's a good point. But that's um, that's what my that's why I picked a three because while I love the original song, it's like yeah. they totally bastardized it by doing what they did to they it. They just rushed it. Yeah. 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 Hey, let's talk about a good song. All maybe. right, let's do it. Mel, what do you think about DuckTales? <sighs> Woo! There you go. Uh, I mean, it's... John, what about you? Yeah, that's all I, that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Are you serious? We all know it's a great theme song because we know pretty much all the words to it except for that one part where we get confused if it's daring, do bad, or do not... Do good. I don't know that part. Yeah. Yeah, 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 daring do bad. I can't do it. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Ducktails. Woo. Uh, th- this is as memorable as a theme song as you can get. Uh, the the fantastic part about this is that this is a hybrid. So this has clips from the actual shows, but this also has a, a bunch. I want to say like three, somewhere between three to five dedicated pieces of actual animation that they have that they created specifically for this theme song which they're great in terms of like being, they're great to be able to put in between the clips as quick interstitials. And it just kind of makes light and kind of spoofs like, you know, just how greedy Scrooge McDuck actually is or just how thrifty he is by like having that alien snatch that dollar out of his hand. Like I don't remember an alien snatching a dollar out of his hand episode, but those things are goofy. And like, I remember them so distinctly. Again, I never thought that I'd say this about the music in a theme song i've made comments saying like i didn't think that that was going to be as sweet of a flute riff earlier this month which is right. a surprising comment for me to say <laughs> it's a weird thing to say yeah. now i'm about to make another comment which is wow what a slamming bass riff that was i could have listened to that the entire time i love i love the lyrics for this i love the music i think that they the the animation only further complements this this is i mean this is really a hat trick of a theme song for me yeah, for me, I think if we would have watched this earlier in the month, it might have gotten a slightly higher score. But the fact that we watched two of my all-time favorites of all cartoons, not just Disney cartoons, but two of my all-time favorites last week as far as theme songs go, they were in my mind when I was watching this. So it was really difficult to kind of equate them or rank them or whatever, but it, it really is just like one of the best that you can have. So for me, uh, I gave it an 8, but I can be swayed. So Mel, how did you score this? I gave it a 10. It's a perfect 10, theme perfect. song. Like ha- like Sean said, it's a hat trick. And it's not even just that, but it's also sweet horns. <laughs> Kim and Dempsey. Sweet, sweet horns. And a nice, a nice key change. Or they they learned history. early on to Duck bump that Tales. key change up. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, for me, it's a 10 uh, as well. And I, I think the challenge, that because I, I, I love the Rescue Rangers theme song. There are very yeah. few theme songs that I still to this day can just like on a dime be able to recite in full and Rescue Rangers and DuckTales are. And the thing that I will knock theme songs about is not doing some type of a, an introduction of some of those characters and neither of them do that. For me, I think the thing that stands out above Rescue Rangers is the dedicated animation uh, that they have that's for this. I, I, I like seeing that. It's one of those things that like 
if, if you don't pay attention, you know, if you were getting cereal during the time or like going to the bathroom as the episode was about to start, you might miss those. But if you stuck around and watch it, you were rewarded because those were memories that I still have from the show. I'll tell you what, I'll give a concession point and I'll bump it up to a nine. Yeah. It's, it's still, it's so good. It's so good. Because even if you only hit the woo part, you're fine. Yeah. Pretty much. You're good. I still love the other ones though, man. There's something just about like the adventure of them that they really sell me on. I know. So I think I they're, know. and I don't even remember what I ranked them. I might have ranked them an eight. So I don't even know. But um, all right, let's head on back over to Agrabah. And now we're going to talk about animation style. So Mel, was there anything that jumped out at you for good or for bad? <laughs> So um, character design, all, anything that uh, can be lumped into animation. So I, I had going to be honest with you. I had a really hard time making discerning decisions about animation style because okay. it's pretty much a one for one of like the original Disney, yeah. except it's a little softer around the edges. It's not as crisp. Um, I imagine because this came out in 94. Mm hmm. Um, and they were making they were making more advancements with because um, I know they hand drew like most of like so like Little Mermaid was hand drawn Aladdin was hand drawn and then Beauty and the Beast was hand drawn and then for I the think most part. and then yeah, I think they started one. yeah I think then they started to move over to computer animation so I'm sure this was like we'll take some pre existing so it was very obvious and this is the reason I gave Aladdin the score it was a pretty steep downfall from what I had. Hmm. Because um, I did not catch the name of the villain's sidekick, the guy who was like, "I'm so glad that I didn't go hitch my, like hitch my load to that hot mess. I'm going back to wherever." They Dick. never said his name in the in the episode, episode which was irritating. Yeah. But his name is Harood Hazi Bin. Oh, that one was Harood. Okay, I call him Harood. So, uh, so Harood, as Sean might say, was pretty much a lift and shift copy pasta of Jafar. I mean, like it was so clear that they just took Jafar's animation and they just gave him a darker shade of skin tone. And that was like pretty much it. So they took away his sweet clothes. Yeah. And like, so for that laziness, that was pretty much where I determined my score from there. So, that, okay. So that's less of a character issue and more of an animation character design. Yeah. I mean, I like all the designs of all the characters. Mm -hmm. I They harken back to things that I love about Aladdin. I've always loved Aladdin's like actual design as a person. He, I had yeah. his Barbie doll. Oh, really? Oh, I loved Aladdin. Ala like I said, <laughs> Aladdin was like one of my favorite animated shows growing up. And I had an Aladdin doll that I made fuck all my Barbies. Oh, my God. Wow. Because wow. that's what you do as a child, <laughs> experimenting can, with sexuality. 100% get... Uh, you're welcome, SMC fans. Write me in the comments if you've done the same. Did the Barbies ever have any babies? Oh, no. I don't, no, know, no. How, I don't know how... No baby Barbies. No, no baby, no baby Barbies. Barbies. No. Explain Aladdin's pants to me, because I've never understood how he does all the things that he does, parkour and whatnot. Well, the, his knees Essentially, bend. the sack pants. His knees bend. Yeah, I mean, how did MC Hammer dance? I mean, Don't he's even wearing, get he's wearing hammer MC pants, hammer, bro. Do not bring that and into this house. He's wearing MC Hammer pants, bro. Wait, why, why would the balloon pants inhibit you from the parkour? Where, where does the, how far up does that seam go? Because your legs need to be able to go this way. Sometimes. Yeah, well, the but the crotch is low. That's what I'm saying, though. Yeah, so if you, you're running over rooftops and parkouring away from guards and oh. trying to stay one step ahead, ahead of, of the everybody. Fan time. Yeah, Blim I mean, time. see, they could have opened with that song. Sorry, that would have been amazing. Ugh, that would have been. I love that song. Fucking killer. Song. I know, I know. How do we I go back in time? Anywho, uh, no, but the Sean has the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the legs are not tight, so they they move up and down as they need to. But is is it just like a giant like inflatable? I don't understand. I think I have to wear these to find out. I'll I'll sh I'll send you a pair. You send me a pair of yeah. Aladdin pants. Yes, nice. Right. And then I got to parkour over an Atlanta <laughs> rooftop. There you go. <laughs> well, you'll see me on the news one way or the other. If you can swing on like a like a clothesline on your way up, that'd be like really. I'll try. Clinch. It worked in the game, Sean. Buddy, what about you? Animation style. I mean, it, it's it's. I have the same notes that that Melanie has. Is that this this is essentially Aladdin, just not the highest quality Aladdin, but it's the exact same character design and yeah. essentially the same character animation. There's just. I knocked this a couple points because of just with the reduction in the quality that's there. Like you said, there is some copy pasta in terms of these characters, uh, as well as there's some jank 
in terms of the animation every once in a while. <laughs> like, when, <laughs> like when people are moving. But I mean, this is this is almost this is almost if you I, I can't imagine that this is what the pitch was. If you love Disney's Aladdin, you love Disney's Aladdin every day after school. And somebody was like, great. That's like 100 percent. So like commercial was what think, do yeah. what do we need to do to animate this? And they're like, don't worry about it. We're just going to reuse cells that we had from the movie. And somebody's like, well, we still have those lying around. And they're like, yeah, we have all of them. We're Disney. And like, great, just make a show with that. And I'm fine with that. It's just, you know, yeah. there was, in the similar sense that we saw Timon and Pumbaa have that reduction in quality and sort of that brightness in terms of its color palette from what the movie actually was for The Lion King, this kind of suffers from some of that as well. So it, it's the same design, but then just some of the the jank is introduced in the animation. And, and sometimes the colors are a little bit muted. I was really surprised mm. to see how much Aladdin's wardrobe blended in with like the background bazaar and Agrabah. And that was kind of it's kind of weird. They didn't try to really distinguish them or pull them out in any way to make a pop. Well, yeah, I will say with that, sometimes though we are watching these on kind of uh, whatever we can find. Daily so, motion. Yeah. So I don't know 100% how great that quality is. Now, granted, if you were watching it in 1994 on your nuclear submarine, it wasn't going to be that great either. I went the other way with this one. I was really impressed by all of the background uh, paintings, the the bizarre, the detail in the bizarre, the fact that it, it wasn't just static, like it actually changed based on events that they had within the episode itself. So things did actually change. The environment was one of the better ones I can remember from any of the Disney cartoons, especially the ones that we watched. Uh, <laughs> I love the the design of the city. And yeah, I know they're lifting most of this from the movie itself, but just because they use the template for it, I still think that it's it's viable for the the series itself yeah no, i agree um i do remember and we didn't get to see it in this episode i do remember not being so super impressed by the palace it always seemed just kind of like a big vacant kind of unfriendly not super warm place to be and we don't see it very often we they get like a yeah. glimpse or two and like that battle scene and that's pretty much it but that's another thing that i really like they actually play with um depth of field a lot in this one mm. we saw that briefly in gummy bears that did not work very well they tried to use <laughs> By making things larger, closer to the camera, they tried to make sort of like that illusion of depth, but it just looked like a horse-sized chunk of meat <laughs> was like sitting in front of the frame. For this, they actually did a really good job, I think, of uh, differentiating between establishing shots of like Agrabah, the desert, a cave, and then close-ups. They would occasionally use close-ups on certain characters. And yeah, that's where some of the womp comes in, because they like, whoop, like zoom in on your face and your eyes go a little wall-eyed. But... I like the fact that they actually incorporated some interesting camera movements with that. Um, another thing was they had a they had a ton of fun with Genie's magic. You get to see yeah. a lot more magic on display in the series than you ever do in the uh, movie. Now it's because you only have a certain amount of runtime in that movie. It's not quite as grand a display. It's more like parlor tricks and just kind of jokey stuff. But the quality of what he gets to do, I thought was was interesting to see, and even attention to detail for things like. If a villain has a sword blade out, they do that kind of like reflected light, that little shine on a sword. Just little touches like that. I just, I was actually really impressed yeah, that, by that. That little gleam. A little gleam. We'll talk more about Genie's I, magic I, parlor I, tricks later. I started with a 10 for this, and then you guys kind of backed me down, so I'm down to a 9. It's honestly my favorite of what we watched so far this month. Mm -hmm. I think it stands, it stands above the rest of them. That's fair. For different reasons. That's fair. What about you guys? I gave it a 6. Okay. And I gave it an eight. Uh, I really, I mean, I really do love the the animation style and everything. And I, I think I knocked uh, two points off for the the lower quality and, and with the color palette and just the yeah. jank. But I mean, I I love Aladdin. <laughs> Good old jank. Yeah, gonna get those get jank that jank points. out. <laughs> those jank hey, is points. there any is there any jank to find in uh, Disney's Ducktales? Oh, really? I mean, there definitely is. <laughs> <Or not. laughs> animation style. Okay, so same kind of problem. I was like, I don't really know how to judge it it's all kind of of the same like echelon it's enjoyable yeah. um i didn't find like too much jank there's lots of fun scenic yeah. painting if you're gonna like i think it's very wise of you dave to bring up scenic painting so we've got like lots of fun locations that we can play with um i don't know i thought it was fine like i enjoyed it i don't know did you have were there any locations that stood out for one reason or another uh clearly scrooge mcduck's palace pool of money is always mm -hmm. something that will like forever be in your mind is like i always wish that dc discovery zone was that but it never <laughs> will be but you always imagine that it is when you like go in rest in peace dc discovery zone but um 
Yeah, I think that like that's always very memorable, and they have a lot of fun with it. It has yeah. a lot of like they. So, oh, oh, here's something fun I can talk about with the animation. They Let's do go. a lot of really quick pivots yeah. in the animation, and that all seem very like seamless and flawless, and could be out of place. But like that paired with the plot and the writing, which we'll talk about when we talk about it, it just makes everything like everything makes sense together. Um, very nicely. I guess there's some detailing that's like a little too um, soft around the edges. So like mm-hmm. the like the room where the ship, this like pr- this like prize possession is in, like the ship doesn't have a lot of interesting detail on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like that room isn't very interesting. But everything else, like the the character is all great. Huey, Dewey, and Louie look fantastic. The brothers that cupcake bond their way out of jail, they're great. Like <laughs> it's. The, cool. beagle, the Beagle Boys? The, the Beagle Boys. The, 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 beagle, the beagle, beagle Boys. boys. Cupcake um, Brothers. I like cupcake the Cupcake Brothers. brothers. Cupcake Cousins. <laughs> <laughs> the Georgetown Cupcake Cousins. Um, so yeah, they're they're all fine and great, but I don't I didn't have really I was like, I feel pleasant about the about yeah. the animation style generally. I didn't feel shitty like I did with Aladdin. So <laughs> oh, oh, ow. Aladdin. And I still gave it above down. a five, so that's true, that's true. Better Fuck. than average. What about you, Sean? Uh, so it just you know, if we're we're talking about the fact that, and David, I know that you mentioned very early on in the show about sort of the sequence that we had for this, like Gummy Bears was sort of the the original like mid '80s Disney cartoon that they had that they they went into sort of syndication or for like uh, you know weekends or, or after school for for people who had the Disney Channel. Ducktales was the one that like you know kind of really set the set the bar for everything else that we talked about with Rescue Rangers, right? But it's fun because I think a lot of the qualities that I talked about with gummy bears last week about uh, big, bold primary colors, these characters having really big eyes, a uh, little bit of jank every once in a while in some of the animation. You can't escape jank in, uh, in, in, in the eighties in animation. It's it's in this case though, it was welcome. And I, I think the biggest thing that we've talked about that I was uh, so in love with, with this uh, was, was really the location, like the, the locations of this, Almost made this show the money bin, uh, you know the the dock where Donald was saying like his mm-hmm. his goodbyes, uh, you know even when they do like a flashback for like two seconds and he's on a naval ship like yeah. all of these things the theater that we had that was in there where they were confronting the Beagle Boys and La like Ronge. and yeah and El Capitan like you had all these really distinct locations and I love Duckburg when you get the wide shot of the actual city itself. Mm-hmm. And there's something that seems so interesting and quaint and delightful about it. And then just like in the background is like an eyesore. There's just this giant fucking money bin that's there. Yeah, just <laughs> and, a giant rectangular eyesore. And, and, and just, and you know, and, and everything that they have that's in uh, McDuck's mansion, you know, from just the the detail that you have that's in the grounds, the outside, uh, the, our butler that we're going to get a chance to talk about tonight. And just like the cots, they didn't have to animate cots that the boys were sleeping on in an attic. Like, but they put all these things in there, and like they were all well fleshed out and put together. Like even the uniform and the badges that they had uh, for uh, the junior wood uh, woodchucks. Those like, hats are adorable. Those things are yeah. great. I felt that there were so many specific things that they put in the show that were detailed and 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 drawn and crafted specifically for Ducktales. And I say this after having watched so much. Disney cartoons. I, I watched a ton of Disney cartoons as a kid growing up, and so uh, there was a lot of you know uh, Donald Duck, a lot of Scrooge, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And I just I felt like with this, like you, this animation gave them personality, you know, above and beyond just like a bunch of fighting ducks that they used to have. <laughs> fighting ducks, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, you know, so I I loved the animation style with this. I thought it was great. Yeah, I think you guys have pretty much said it. And honestly, I'm not I don't really have any knocks on this. I want to talk about locations when we get to plot a little bit because I want to know how easy it was to follow exactly where everybody was at any given time mm. um in the plot itself. But honestly, this this kind of set the standard, right? It was it came after Gummy Bears, but I think whatever they learned on Gummy Bears, they rolled into this and they were like, "Okay, we can do this for syndication." And that's why it was so successful. Yeah. And super colorful. If you're talking about uh an update on previous Donald Duck cartoons or previous cartoons to feature the nephews or any of these other characters that kind of pop into there. 
um, you know, go back and look at the comics too and see how they've kind of changed. They've, they've kept a lot of the same kind of styles, but they modernized it for the time, just as the current reboot on Disney Channel or, or is that Disney XD? I it's can't Disney remember. Disney XD, yeah. Disney XD, yeah. just how they've modernized it, but they've kept the same ideas from the original designs. So for me, I gave it an 8 out of 10, uh, just because I, I feel like it, it, it wore over the test of time a little bit more for me. But honestly, it's, it's one of the best that you'll find. No. I, I gave it the same, 8 out of 10. Nice. Oh, we're three eights in a row. Look at that. What's Time up? to retire. Time to retire. Dive into our money bean. It's funny that you mentioned that thing about the vibrancy of it because I distinctly have a memory, and I'm not sure where it's from, but I used to watch, I, I, would, like, I have a lot of tapes, obviously, mm-hmm. the famous Lussell Harker tapes from my childhood, uh, where she just taped everything that I would watch, and she one just taped a- dates with Aladdin and Barbie. Just it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, but I had this one tape where it was like Disney Winter Spectacular or something, and it was like a it was like a mix of um, like ice skating, where like live action people would dress up like oh, Disney sure. characters, and so there was like an Aladdin and Jasmine like ice skating thing, yeah. but then it was interspersed with like. I guess like older cartoons and there was this one of Huey, Dewey and Louie um, where it was walking in a winter wonderland mm. and they were like rec- like wrecking havoc and like they were, um, you know, trying to trying to create Parson Brown. Oh, okay. The snowman that they talk right. about in in Walking in a Winter Wonderland. So that Aladdin and the Barbies could get married. So that Aladdin and the Barbies could get married. But I remember right. I remember that cartoon. Like that was my first introduction to the three little guys. And I remember that cartoon being very vibrant as well. And like I loved mm-hmm. that animation style. Although it was a little closer to like Sleeping Beauty than it was. I don't know when it was made. I probably can't track this down. If anyone out there knows what I'm talking about, give me some information. I tried Googling and I failed. <sighs> I actually haven't Googled it all. I know but what you're talking about. like All the Disney on ice memory. that they had. Yeah. 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 Those were great. But I remember that being like a special, yeah, like a VHS packaged special. Yeah. Where they would also have like the older cartoons packaged in there for like filler. Yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. like in between. And then they would have these like yeah. moments, these like special Disney snowflake moments or some shit. I don't remember. It was. And I think they, I think they rolled in there too. Things like um, some of Goofy's like sporting things where he would be like going skiing and falling off cliffs yep. as he always Yep, did, so. exactly. I love those shorts. Yeah. Good stuff. It was totally like that. Anyway. Yeah, guys, we've got characters. We've got Speaking of classic Disney yeah. characters, I don't think we have to spend too much time on these. No. Because no. Honestly, is there any difference, especially for Aladdin? Mel, is there anything that stood out to you one way or another or maybe talk about a new character that was introduced? Aladdin was a lot shittier than I remember him. Interesting. A lot shittier. Yeah. I think that's going to come to light in the plot. <laughs> So that's all I got 100%. about that. That's all I got Fair about enough. that. Fair uh, enough. Uh, I loved for the characters. I love that you know they still have that original Disney design. I, I love the fact that it's they they have the voice cast on this is fantastic. Yeah. You know we have uh, Scott Weinger who did the original Aladdin. We have Abu as Frank Welker. Diago is still played by Gilbert Godfrey. Iago. Oh, sorry, Iago. Twenty five years he's been calling him Diago. Yeah. <laughs> he's Diago. Diago. Go. Uh, Magic Carpet is voiced by Magic Carpet. Uh, we mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and just that Abbas Mall is, is voiced by Jason Alexander. So like hearing these voices and knowing who they are and ha- these individual voice actors having such unique voices, I think did a great job. And I love the fact that they actually retained some of the original cast to be able to contribute to this as well. Wasn't there a big shit about Robin Williams not coming back to do the voice? I like vaguely remember something about this. I think the biggest thing, look, if you go pre-Aladdin, talking about the feature, if you go pre-Aladdin, most of the cast members are people you'd never heard of. Right. Because they were like professional voice actors. Now they're actors obviously in their own right, but they made a living and they did quite a bit as voice actors. Look at Frank Welker. I mean, he'd been doing it for even 20 years or whatever at that point, but just doing like bit parts and, and the weird characters and animals and all kinds of stuff. Robin Williams, I think, was one of, if not the first, to really, well, that's not true. They had like Dom DeLuise and, and folks like that for like American Tale and some of the, the Bakshi animated stuff. But Robin Williams was like one of the, what are you laughing at? See, I forgot that Dom DeLuise is in that. That's awful. I actually didn't know. I didn't know that. He's Tiger. He's Tiger. Guys. He's Tiger. God. I'll put him up. So good. I'll put him up. 
the brothers Karamazov. Anyway. So um, he was one of the biggest names that they had like snagged. One of the biggest names that they were that. like, oh, an actual like big name actor is doing a kid's cartoon. And it was one of those things that started a transition of not only like, oh, recognizable actor names in a quote unquote kid's cartoon movie, but also for those actors like, hey, there's a shit ton of money to be made here if you <laughs> sign this and it's not a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, it is, but it's not like the on camera grind where you're there for like two, three months or whatever. That started the transition. So if you if you look at you know movies after that, you can kind of start to see more big name celebrities coming in. And then more recently, within the last decade or so, a lot of them moved from uh, the feature films onto the series themselves, which was not anything that really happened in the 90s and right. even early 2000s. Like a lot of times these days, those big name A list celebrities will still voice their TV roles. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. But I mean, it's it's good for them good yeah. money good exposure and they keep control of that character too exactly so. um for me dom del Luz was my favorite character in aladdin <laughs> <laughs> uh, no i really loved what they did with uh, abu and iago i thought it was interesting that they kind of paired those two up as sort of opposites and they kind of played off each other a little bit iago was still kind of an irritating shit mm -hmm. but he was less annoying because uh, he was on the good guy's side, <laughs> I thought, in the series. Uh, it's actually pronounced Diago. Dave, Diego. Just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, there was no Jasmine, no Sultan, no Raja in this episode, so I kind of knocked it for that. And we already talked about the poorly named pun characters yep. earlier in the episode. So for me, it was an 8 out of 10, because it's still like, I love these characters. I'd, I'd still love to go back and have more adventures with them. Mel? Oh, I'm going to blow this up. <laughs> I gave it a That's 5. Okay. That's 5 okay. out of 10. It, and and you mentioned something that I had not mentioned, but I did write about halfway through this episode, which is, oh, so they're not going to have any female characters. I forgot what this feels like. Yeah. That's what I said. Mid-90s. Yeah. And still today. Mm. Uh, we'll have to close this out with an eight as well. Okay. Fair enough. I give it a four now. <laughs> spike <laughs> points coming back. Spike, spike points. points. Spike points. Without Mel, we haven't had spike points. I know, oh, and it's all, I'm only closing it out. Points. Mel, did you want to talk right. about Genie at all? Did you have anything in characters to talk about Genie? Oh, uh, I didn't know if this was more plot than it was what? character. I guess, okay, so my brief thing about Genie, yeah. or do you, do you want me to wait? I'm fine with talking about it now, because honestly, for plot, we're just kind of going to hit the high points and talk about what worked and what didn't. So if you think it's better there. Oh, uh, drawing the door was the only useful thing Genie did one. all episode. That was oh, like... Uh, that's the only no, uh, maybe we should save this for the yeah, plot yeah, yeah. let's, let's save this for the plot that. okay great yeah. I'll, I'll restart this at the plot then <laughs> so let's go over to the ducktales yeah take it away mel <clears throat> all right we're at characters they're all Correct. gems they're all <laughs> lovely uh adorable individuals that have real depth of character that they managed to pack into a very short episode um i have a real soft spot for donald duck because mm -hmm. my grandfather uh, well, my step grandfather, technically, I suppose. My my grandpa Don was in the Navy, and he was a duck. W is a duck. Damn it! No, and <laughs> name was Don. And so, oh, and so he he adopted the name Donald Duck. And so, in his house, when I was growing up, there were like all of these like Donald Duck paraphernalia, and people would like buy him a lot of Donald Duck things. That's and cute. he had so he had like the hat. There's like this famous picture of him with like the hat and everything. Um, but so I have a real soft spot for Donald Duck, even though cool. you can't understand him, but that's totally yeah, fine. Tell me about it. Um, that's closer to my grandpa Don in his later years. Anywho, so he, all, all those characters are really lovely, but honestly, the thing that I was really surprised about was how, and this again blends a little bit with plot, but you got this real depth of like character development in an honest way in a very short period of time, especially with sure. the McDuck, the Scrooge McDuck. Because he went from being like, why are these pipsqueaks on my doorstep to like, oh, no, you're right. I do need family, um, which I thought was really lovely. And then uh, side note, we had a, a brief, Sean Paul Ellis and I had a brief conversation during the episode where he said, who is you and Dewey and Louie's father or like parental units? And because both of them are uncles. Mm -hmm. And right. Donald Duck is their legal guardian. And I was Everybody's like, Everybody's everybody else's uncle in this well, universe. But it's a Disney movie. And if they had actual parents that were both alive, you'd have to like envision them having duck sex. And so mm -hmm. they just eliminated that altogether. <laughs> Which is, if you Google it, a whole rabbit hole worth of <laughs> things you don't want to know about. Do yeah. not. Uh, don't do it. I actually can answer that question about. Uh, some of their their lineage. Ooh. Can you? Because 
the reboot is supposed to do that when that comes back. Well, I mean, which... I, I think that it's, it's going to help with that, but the original um, is, uh, so Donald Duck has a sister. Oh my God. Uh, who's named uh, Della Duck. Great. D-E-L-L-A. Great name. And then unfortunately in, a, in an episode that they had that was called Donald's Nephews, she's called uh, Dumbbella. Like dumb, Aww. like yeah. So it's derived. Yeah, uh, well, there goes that. <clears throat> yep. So she is the mother of Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Uh, she is first kind of uh, described and 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 mentioned uh, as like dropping off the kids, dropping off Huey, Dewey, and Louie to Donald to have him watch them because she has to go attend to Huey, Dewey, and Louie's father who is in the hospital. Because Huey, Dewey, and Louie put him in the hospital by lighting firecrackers on his chair. I feel like Sean and could sending be him into up. the emergency room. I, I'm not. I'm not kidding. Uh, so <clears throat> this is like sort of the like the tale that they have now. They uh, they're they're beginning. I think they widely steered around. This that, is widely. horrifying. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, like, but like, this was like back in like the like the late 30s when they were when they were yeah when nine out of you know. Five out of ten kids were lost to firecracker accidents. Yeah. <laughs> when their dads were lost to firecracker yeah. accidents, uh, and so, but you you are correct in the in the reboot, and I'm not going to spoil anything. They are yeah. uh, reintroducing and talking a little bit about uh, their their parents that they have, which is fun. Um, but yeah, this is like they put their kid, they put their dad in the hospital, and then they don't really ever mention the dad, uh, right. you know, for for anything, and so they just like they just have a mom. And and an uncle who was only supposed to take care of them for one day, and then this turned into like a lifelong thing for him, where he's now. And then obligated. he's like, "Fuck it, and going to the navy, <laughs> care of these kids." <laughs> I'm gonna give it to my old uncle. <laughs> Just keep passing this down the chain. Oh man, yeah. these kids are gonna have a lot of psychological issues. No. Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. For me, for these characters, I absolutely love everything that's about it. I think the the strength that they have for this is that. You know, they if you were unfamiliar with some of the Donald Duck cartoons or the Scrooge McDuck cartoons and comics that they had, uh, this does a great job of being able to bring in a lot of characters to really flesh out Scrooge's world and the people who were around him. And then with this initial episode, it only gets better. There are so many people that come into their kind of duck family. I don't know, into their into their gaggle. Perfect. Yeah, gaggles, 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 geese. geese. But, uh, it's a flock. Know, flock. Come into their flock. Flocks, yeah, good. I'll so, allow both of it. Yeah, they're they're Gaggle just flock. There's so many people that come into their flock that just really are are meaningful and fun characters, and you then you see them in like Darkwing Duck and and right. other areas of the show. And so I, I love this show as being sort of that that OG in order to kind of create and then push out these characters to other fun cartoons that we've watched. I'm gonna call a group of Disney ducks a gockle. Just because I like a the way. Oh, it's I was gonna say a uh, flockle. Flockle or a gockles, fine with me. I like gock. Probably I think fine. Gockle Frag- is fraggles. A fraggle rock. Um, the only thing you guys have said this a couple times that like this episode did a good job of differentiating and developing characters. I'll agree for Scrooge. I'll agree for for Duckworth a little bit. I didn't, and Donald obviously. I didn't get a lot of differentiation for Huey, Dewey, and Louie though. Like I don't. I don't know them apart from each other versus but that's uh, actually the part color of, coordination. That's actually part of the punchline between the three of them is that they're supposed to be so so brotherly and like so uh, like that they can finish each other's sentences. That they they just and that continues to be a punchline in a lot of the comic strips that they had for Donald Duck was sure. that people would say like you know I can barely tell you guys apart and then they would all respond in unison. Uh, to that like you know which kind of only further exacerbated the problem of them actually having unique identities Eh, i'm still kind of weirdly i like the treatment in quack pack better and definitely in the modern reboot you fucking take that back as far just as far as differentiating the individual ducklings in this flockle uh so for me having them all kind of together i don't know i never really liked that because i couldn't really identify with any one of them because they were all the same Thing. So what did you what did you score this, Dave? I scored it a seven out of ten. Okay, Mel. Ten out of ten. Oh. Da, 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 woo. Uh, I gave this I gave this a point for lack of female characters. One. Point. So one point. One out of ten. I, I went this on. down to nine out of ten. <laughs> 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 one out of ten. <laughs> yeah. Where's there was no Mrs. Mrs. Beasley? 
Be- Be- Beakley? Uh, Beakley. This is Beakley, was which it? the reboot, by the way, does an amazing job. Beakley was great. Um, and then she brings Webby in, I think, in, in both series. Yes. It was great, too. But honestly, that's about as far as it goes until you get to Magicka, until you get to Goldie. Oh, my God. If you go back and watch some of the episodes with uh, Goldie, what's her last name? Goldie something heart. It's probably just like Goldie Goldheart or something. Scrooge's like long term, long ago girlfriend. Those are some of the best episodes of DuckTales to watch. Mm. They really do have some good ones. Look for the one where they like go to the Yukon and like go go to an old prospecting mine. That's one of the best, one of the best episodes. Cool. So it's not that I don't love this series or show. It's just that this particular episode for me, it was serviceable for for an introductory one. Yeah, seven out of ten is not bad. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's get plot into this stuff. plot. Aladdin, air plot. feathered friends. What worked for you, elementalist ornithologist Melanie Harker, and what did not? All right. What worked for me? Had a very interesting villain, came in very mysteriously. These wind, they call them the wind demons, kind of mm-hmm. whirl into town. <laughs> they steal a bunch of crap, which Aladdin very astutely observes. They're not like attacking people, they're just stealing things and then they're leaving. Um, they do an interesting, uh, an interesting reveal of what the cause of the villain's ability to like whirlwind their way in. They say like, "Oh well, they're they're taking rock feathers, mm-hmm. rock R O C." So after the show was done, I decided to do some research, mm-hmm. and there is a you know an Arabic mythological character Pokemon. known as the Rock. Mm-hmm. Appears in Arabic geographies and natural history, popularized in Arabian fairy tales and sailors' folklore. Um, Ibn Battuta tells of a mountain hovering in the air over the China Seas, which was the rock. The popular story collection 1001 Nights includes tales of Abd al Rahman and Sinbad the Sailor, both which also include the rock. So, kudos to this first episode for introducing, like, you know, real world mythology and making it kind of fun and like having its own fun with it. Right. Um, what else did I like about this episode? I'm just upset that they didn't make the rock like have like a pun tastic name like they did for everybody else in this. They don't need it. They don't need it. The rock was the rock. Yeah. I mean, I mean, rock I'll, is the I, rock. I'm going to also contend that everybody else who had a pun name in this didn't need it either, but they still yep. shoehorned it in there. So those were all my favorite things about the episode. My least favorite things. I wrote, good old genie and deep cut unintelligible impressions that no one who's watching the show is going to understand, which is how I felt about genie in those like very brief moments in the movie, which have now been distilled down to much less time and many more impressions that you just can't understand. Um, I wrote, oh my God, it's a puppy mill for rocks. <laughs> so that was terrible that they decided to do this. It's a long time since I've watched anything without women. So I said that. Um, mm-hmm. Aladdin, like I said earlier, like he was just shittier than normal. He always, he bites off more than he can chew, which he, of course, that's like the whole plot of Aladdin the movie. He's just like, oh, I can pretend to be a prince. No problem. We'll figure this out. And in this, he's like, oh, yeah, let's just like keep going deeper into this hole when I know that my best friend's like willingness and like livelihood is on the line Freedom. here. Freedom. <laughs> yeah, right? um, so that was horrible. And then he allowed those assholes in Agrabah to take the monkey and did nothing to prevent that from happening. You're talking about uh, Fazel. Sure. Yeah, the, the premise of this is essentially when these demons come in, the guards are kind of scared off and they don't want to deal with them because they think they're sort of like mythical, magical beings. But as Mel mentioned, Aladdin sees that they're just like stealing material goods. They're like, no, there's something's going on and I can figure it out. You don't have to be a sand flea or a sand gnat or whatever to be able to figure this out. So then they just randomly come up with this barter, not even a barter, like a, like a bet. And they're like, well, if you can figure it out, cool, then this my second in command guard will be, well, he'll, he'll go pick dates for your monkey for like ever or whatever. It's like, but if you can't solve it, then we get the monkey and the monkey will pick dates for us. And Aladdin's just like, eh. But then because his pride is threatened, he's kind of forced into it, even though he could have just been like, no, fuck off. Like, I don't, I don't care that much. <laughs> Instead, he's just like, yeah, I should probably give up my monkey's freedom and commit exactly. him into slavery what for this the fat guard. Fuck. No, I mean, like, you can tell when you're really good friends with somebody by how willing you are to bet their life and put it on the line for yeah. eight, for something as simple as, like, 
you know what? We're gonna figure out if these are wind demons or not. Like it's yeah. such it's such a shitty conceit. Or even the fact Between that it's like two the best friends' job to do that. It's not Aladdin's job to do no. that. Even though he kind of took it upon himself, I guess, with the movies as the quote savior of Agrabah. Yeah, I mean, you know, but like still savior, in his weird. He's the savior. Pants. He is the savior of Agrabah, <laughs> but nobody said he's like best friend to everybody in Agrabah. He's like, I'll sure. fucking I'll wager all of you on a craps game. Yeah, I will and get rid of under... everyone in this damn city. I will throw you under the equivalent of a bus, whatever this is in the bazaar. <laughs> is it a camel? Ox cart? Some mode of transportation? I'll go with ox cart. Yeah. So not Speaking only of transportation, I want a rock feather though. Tell no, me. I want yeah. carpet so bad. I've always wanted carpet. Yeah, he was always my favorite. He's so the, fucking uh, cool. Which is so weird because it's like a, it's literally just a rug. And also. It's kinda- Oh, it's well, just, castles, and that's it. He yeah. never talks. And this this further justifies my dislike of the characters in this. They really took away and diminished like Carpet's personality in this. I felt in this, he yeah, he literally just comes in to either save the day or to scoop them out of a situation, and then that's it. And then he's kind of like sidelined. And if we're gonna pick <laughs> characters, like if we're gonna like weigh them against each other, so we added Iago. Right. Which, like, why Gilbert Gottfried? Like, you had the reason your character loved. Yeah. Ugh, the right. reason your character was a bit character was because you just fucking scream all the time. Oh my god! And then that's it. And it's like, oh my god, put it down, put it down, mute the television. I can't handle it. Uh, so two points. It's pronounced Diago. <laughs> and then so- <laughs> second point. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, second point is is that I, I agree with you in the fact that like. The the one of the greatest things about this was the fact like and and I, I know that uh you know it, it, it's weird to suddenly have somebody who was a villain associate in the movie suddenly right. become a main good guy character in this. I and actually I think it's is it the first or second movie that he switches allegiances though. Oh, who knows? So it's not just like he out of nowhere just like is with the good guys. I'm pretty sure that happens in one of the movies. I think it's at the very end of the first movie of the original. I think it's at the end of the Latin, first movie yeah. and then in the second movie he kind of gets like drawn back in. He's like, I don't want to be a part of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's funny that like they would do something like that uh, but also that that character would be the voice of reason like despite the fact that every time he's screaming like but like he's the one who's just like, you're making a real shitty bet by throwing your friend in this fucking date picking <laughs> thing. Like, maybe not be such a garbage pile. I don't. He was. He was. I don't know if it's really the voice of reason so much as the voice of, like, sometimes cowardice and the voice of, like, let's just go back home and just eat some pomegranates. Like, I don't know why he went Jewish grandma there for a second, but, like. <laughs> it's Gilbert Godfrey. It's Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> oh, it's Gilbert Godfrey. That's why. But I like, I actually like that. I like that uh, Aladdin's very impetuous. Abu just kind of wants to do his own thing. But he's got heart to him, obviously. Aladdin, a little less so. But then Iago actually has a moment where he thinks he's going to lose um, his kind of like frenemy, right? With Abu. And he actually has kind of a nice moment where he's like, we really got to get him back. And we'll do, I guess I'll do, I'll come along for the ride and we'll go get him. But don't tell that monkey that I almost cried for him or whatever. He's actually got more, more of a heartfelt response than Aladdin does. Iago is the id. That's that's I sometimes I, I feel like Abu is. Hmm. Discuss in the comments. I yeah, Discuss I don't remember enough about psychology to yeah. parse them out. But I like know. it was yeah. id ego super ego. So because it started yeah, but I don't know right. what they all so like getting fancy over here. It starts with Abu in the market <laughs> going and just like stealing food again. Right. And that's what starts this whole thing off. Mm-hmm. So for me, he would be more of the id because he's just kind of like going and stealing where he can just literally, they say it, he can go climb a tree and get dates. Aladdin's got pocket money because he bails him out with it. He's not on hard times anymore. He's married to the princess. He's totally yeah. fine. So there's like no reason for that. So the mm-hmm. fact that Abu is still stealing, Aladdin looks like a good guy because he gets him out of that jam, but then he's just like, now I'm going to bet your life into sl- slavery. <laughs> it's a really weird turn. It, yeah. it's, it's hard because, you know, it, it, for these characters that you know and love, it really feels like that have had two feature full length yeah. films. You really feel like for this first pilot episode, you didn't learn fucking anything no. from Maybe what's don't happened. Sell your buddy into slavery. Yeah. No way. So well, what's the what's the worst part though? Right when everything because obviously it all works out fine, the good guys win. But when Abu is freed from his shackles, how does Aladdin respond? I had to like save your save you again. Yeah, or he something. He was just he, like, "Oh, you 
I'll always be there to clean up your mess kind of thing. Yeah. Like, and I they, was like, you you fuck? made yeah. this mess. Yeah. yeah. They have he they have like a really kind of tender moment where Aladdin is just like, I'm really sorry. Like, are we friends? And I, I would have been like, you you fucking initiated all of this. Like you yeah. you were the impetus behind every bad decision in this episode. Yeah, you should have been stealing from the market though. Fair. You lose your hands for that in Riyadh. It's true. Fair. Office space. Uh, for, well, Sean, did you get a chance to say anything? Any uh, high yeah, points, low absolutely. points from the plot? Okay. I like the mythology of it. I like, I liked, Ab- I'm just responding to your guys' points. I liked, I actually liked Abismal as kind of like a weird kind of thief, kind of wants to take over Agrabah, but is really not super confident about things, <laughs> but is also really, I like that his second in command is very competent and very smart, but any time he seems like he's getting too much power, Abismal like grabs it back and he gets like real paranoid about it. There's something funny about that. It's probably all in Jason Alexander's delivery. Uh, <laughs> I think fantastic. I think you're right. I think it's all think in it's the actor awesome. because it's really poorly put together. Oh, it's it's completely bonkers. Like it's just it's to Mel's point earlier in the episode, it's just very slapstick for a lot of that stuff. It's very silly. Um, there is some peril and some menace with the sword swinging stuff that's going around, and, and our guys do get kind of trapped and backed into a corner from time to time. But mm-hmm. yeah, now you say bonkers, but no, is it bonkers, D Bobcat? Damn it, get out Got of here! It. Yep, all right, see myself Bottom out. Of the pile. <laughs> Bottom of the pile. Um, yeah, the mythology is probably my favorite part of it. Um, I actually like that more that it was like area specific mm-hmm. mythology. I like that connection. Um, yeah, beyond that, I think that was about it. So honestly, it was it was an entertainment and an entertaining episode for me. I actually ended up liking it more than I thought I would about halfway through. I ended up giving it an eight. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Mel, what did you give? I gave it a five. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm. I am. Uh, this is why we average? Cause yeah. Who the uh, hell knows what this is gonna be? I give it a six. Okay. Yeah. That works. Fair enough. I just based it on the fact that I just I really enjoyed it. Like, a lot of it didn't really make sense. <laughs> a lot of it was very silly. <laughs> But as far as like a first episode, I was like, okay, I know what I'm getting into. Very episodic adventures. Contrast that with DuckTales, which now technically this is the first of a five-part intro, right? So it's essentially a movie. We're watching the first of the five parts. So I was a little concerned coming into it that it wasn't going to be a complete episode, that they were going to leave us with like a cliffhanger. But they actually do a really good job of closing off this first part of the narrative. So Mel, what worked for you? And if there's anything that didn't, what was that? I thought this was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think, as I mentioned earlier, they pack a lot into a very short period of time. So we open with very classic, good old swimming in in the pool in the pool of money. Scrooge McDuck, Um, like I said, he he realizes he's going to be late to to pick up the boys, and so he like he's swimming in his swimming you know swimming suit, and then comes out like totally fully dressed and puts his hat on, and it's like that moment. I'm just like, ah, yes, this is great. You see a montage of like perfectly great reasons why Scrooge McDuck is such a fucking Scrooge. He Mm. like doesn't give money to the poor. He takes all the cheese samples from some poor lady. He won't spend money on a taxi, but will take money from like a a phone, like a pay phone and like Mm -hmm. just take the coins out of it. Um, Like stuff like that is all really, really excellent. Um, Very lovely tender moment while Donald like goes off to like do his heroics. To die. In the sea, is there a war happening? Is that clear at all? Always, always a duck war. Always a duck war. War never changes. War. So then we bring we bring the boys back to the mansion. See, you know that that part was probably the weakest bit. Is like when they finally get to the mansion. And he's they're like, we've been here for days and we haven't seen Uncle Scrooge. And I'm just yeah. like, whoa, that got dark very quickly. And they're like in cots and only being fed cheese, which. Sounds like a dream for me, but may not be a dream for you know folks that are <laughs> lactose intolerant. Tolerance. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, I love that they were keeping them in. This is a, a, a room, a palatial mansion with 75 rooms. And they're being kept in the attic, which like they got a <laughs> great view and a cool little room. But they're like pissed because they can't explore anywhere else. There yeah. were so many very simple jokes, but yeah. that landed just so perfectly in the delivery and what we were seeing. Um, so that was all really excellent. Uh, then we go to the, the cup, the cupcake brothers, the cupcake bombs, bomb brothers, um, which like the, the introduction of that was just like, just enough, like, here are some characters you might be familiar with. 
Um, we're going to break him out of jail to make things interesting. There's a mysterious stranger who has a request. We didn't linger too long on that mysterious stranger or like why he needed the sailboat or anything like that. Um, you know, and then you had like just the right amount of back and forth of like Huey, Dewey and Louie trying to get involved and do the right thing and then being like shut down, but then like really taking matters into their own hands and they're going to build a paraglider just like in Breath of the Wild, and they're just going to paraglide their way around. Of course I brought a Zelda reference into this. And so then they, you know, they they do the thing, and they save the day. And then is they get... weird? Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, the, the final point that is, like, really the like the, the most rewarding part is you get that moment in, in the candy factory when, like, the fight between the Cupcake Brothers of stealing shit and Huey, and Dewey, and Louie, and Scrooge comes yeah. to a head... And the brothers pair with their uncle to like take down these bad motherfuckers. And it's so satisfying. And they flood a building full of chocolate, which is every child's dream. Yep. Yep. I just loved it. Can I ask what the ethical implications are of anthropomorphic duck children wearing like a coonskin cap? Is that fine? Yeah, why? We're okay with that? What's... Because it's an animal. Because it's wearing an animal. An animal, animal wearing an animal. Uh, yeah. Which is kind of what we do, I guess. It's not really a big deal. But... Wait. Well, like there's you... that there's that guy that like wears human bones that have been created into a a cross. So I think we're probably fine here. Are you talking about me? Mm-hmm. Sean, Moving do you have any opinions? Sean. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I, I I loved this. This there was there's so much things that were involved in, and and just to kind of re-emphasize what I talked about earlier about location, you know, we we move around a lot within Duckburg, which really right. makes it feel like it's a fully fleshed out city with citizens and and people that are there that Donald or that sorry that Scrooge can just be an asshole to. Yeah, I have a question about locations though. Sure. Did you guys ever feel lost? Duckburg, or like we didn't 100% know exactly where we were at any given moment because you see Scrooge in a bunch of different places, you see the nephews in a bunch of different places, and then we're introduced to a couple of new places, and you're just kind of like, who is where right now? I, I'll say this I, I didn't get that as much. I, I, the one moment where I wondered like what the actual transition or segue was between scenes is where you see, uh, you see the butler kind of confront the kids when they're going to run after Scrooge. And he's just like, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't go outside. Miss, you know, Mr. McDuck is uh, too busy to see you right now. And then suddenly, like the next scene is like Scrooge with all three kids in tow, yeah, like walking into the money bin. And you're just like, I thought that they just said that. And 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 like Scrooge turns around, and is like, what, what the heck? I thought, I thought the butler was supposed to tell you that you couldn't come to this. And they're just like, yeah, you got a little bit tied up. So like. They do a quick smash cut to show that he's been like put inside of like a just like, rolled, rolled up in a carpet, yeah. and so like you know they they have something fun with that. That was I think the only time that I kind of got uh, I was wondering what the transition or how things happened. Otherwise, I think I was tracking it pretty well. There's well, Mel, you had something to say. I was gonna say <clears throat> the location of the money and the location of the boat and the house were all very confusing because then like yeah. so the same thing that Sean said. And then we also noticed that, um, oh, what was it? Because it's like, to, to orient everybody at home, it's like the Scrooge and obviously Duckworth live at home in the mansion, and that's where the boys stay as well. But then Scrooge at one point goes to his place of business, his office, which is where the money bin is. So that's like the, the facility elsewhere in Duckburg, and that's also where his prized model ship, this tiny little sailboat ship, is being housed. So if anybody wants to break into the money bin, they're going to break into his place of business. That's where all the alarms are. That's where all the security is supposed to be. That's where all this stuff is. So I don't know how far away he is from his uh, his home to the money bin because he gets there very quickly when uh, the alarms go off. So from my understanding, from the from the dock, mm-hmm. obviously we know that's that, three miles. Yeah, we know that it's three miles. Dock. Yeah. And I, I felt and Did I you triangulate. Always, <laughs> are we really trying? Why are we really like orienteering no, no, this no, shit I was right just, now? I was just. Because there are other locations too. There's right, the right. Van Theater, the Larange, and then there's the candy, candy factory, factory that he also owns, which is somewhere. Uh, my my idea was that I always thought that the money bin was on uh, the the McDuck property, just I on like a too. on like a different end of it, which is why they were able to get to it so quickly. 
I thought that too, but then he said he was going into the office to work, so I didn't know if it I, was I've, just like... I've looked at a couple pictures of what hypothetical Duckburg looks like, mm-hmm. and it's always the money bin, his office is on top of like sort of like a hill with the city down below so that they can always kind of like look up <laughs> oh. at, at like his money bin. That um, makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense to have something gaudy like that. I guess I'm kind of curious now. Like, I want to look into that if it's like... if yeah. If it's just the bin by itself and that doubles as his office, or if it's if his mansion is separate from that, because now I'm really confused. And I'm sure William out there, by the time he gets to this episode, is going to let us know. So thanks in advance, William. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but for me, so the reason I bring up the locations, and Sean, I'll get back to you in a second, but for the reason I bring up all these different locations is because there are times where I wanted them to just slow down for a second and have like an honest, a more honest character moment. They do have that by the episode's end because Scrooge gets to kind of he chastises the boys and then he kind of backs off them a little bit and then he yells at them again because he thinks they screwed up and then they come back around at the end. They did a good job with that. Yeah. But a lot of the other stuff is just like the boys rushing around, rushing around. And it was in that moment that I didn't get to, you know, I didn't get to know any of the three of them really at all. Sure. So that was my only kind of knock on it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that we had, a, I think that we, you know, didn't really get a chance to really understand a lot of the the specific boys motivations Huey Dewey and Louie because they you know they are so similar and because they had a lot of stuff going on and you know I think it's I'm sure it was weird for them with the transition period where suddenly they you know they've been passed from like uncle to uncle uh at this point right. uh it, it's interesting I, I still think that they did a good job of kind of showing the the ingenuity and playfulness of the three of them together yeah. Uh, and we got a chance to see that quite often. And so I think that for me watching this, they were always my stand in um, because I would always just be like, oh, I, I like they look like they're having so much fun. Like, look at these adventures that they're going on. Uh, that that's that's kind of what kept me kept me watching for this. And you know, okay. I think to Mel's point, like flooding an entire chocolate factory full of chocolate. Like, why what, would you not want what, that? What kid doesn't want that? Absolutely. So Even no, it, was being... fun. It, it was, again, a little a little Disney forced at the end where the reporter's like, so what about loved ones and family? How do you spend time with them? And he was just like, I know, uh, but it, it's fine yeah, because they did a great job of in that 20 minutes of like introducing everything about Scrooge and how he's a, a penny pincher and, you know, tight fisted and all that mm-hmm. stuff with his money, even though he's literally swimming in it. And then they bring him around to the end where he's like, Oh, Oh, family. And, blood relations and caring yeah, for people yeah, yeah. like that's interesting and that's a great starting point i could have literally watched though all the times where he brings in the solicitors and is that like was funny. God. like that was funny. Sh- hitting a trap door or shooting them with a hose or like having just arms grabbing... come out of the ceiling and just like jacked them out a window and now that's a funny scene when gyra gear comes in to apply for a job because he's basically like down on his luck and he comes in as like a last ditch effort to, to come in and he's so persistent that he goes through a number of those so if you look for that episode where gyro first Arrives on scene. Gonna oh, that's be a fun one to watch. Gonna be worth it. I yeah. love the retired panhandlers of America. That was my favorite yeah. rejected <laughs> solicitor. I love I, even in the beginning when somebody asked him like money for the port, and he goes, "Ah, they're not worth it." It's just like, wow. Like, yeah. The funny thing so was in dark. my notes, I had it written down because I was like, Scrooge McDuck, one of the only like filthy rich characters you can actually root for. And then the very next thing he said was like. <laughs> They're not worth it. And I was like, oh, fuck. There goes that thesis. <laughs> but over just the course of these 20 minutes, you really do come to like, he softens up a lot. And that that is what opens everything up for this, the next four parts in this opener. And obviously the other hundred episodes or whatever that they have. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mel, how did you score this one? I scored it a seven. Nice. I enjoyed it. I give this a nine. Well, I'm right in the middle. I gave it an eight. Makes sense. Cool. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Potpourri time. This right. is very subjective, so just yeah. kind of whatever you're feeling. Mel, what did you score as far as how Disney it was, and what's your reasoning for that? So I gave Aladdin a nine okay. for how oh. Disney it was because Michelle Moskal or Emily Brennan listened to this podcast, which I'm sure Emily tunes in when she can, who are both experts, Emily having done like her master's on Disney, mm-hmm. um, legit. I'm sure that there's like some kind of formula that I could turn to that would tell me how Disney something is. Obviously, like when I think of Aladdin, I think of that original movie. And as this stands up to that movie, it just doesn't. Um, Does that make it less Disney than the original movie? I would say so. It's not the original movie. And the original movie is Disney to me. So that's why I gave that a nine. Sir Sean? So this just kind of felt like 
that friend that graduated from high school with you that then went on to like whatever the next like the state university was that was there sort of like a 13th grade and it didn't mm. quite like the like, local community college sure, sure. but no, like, no like, for example northampton county community College. you know or if you're in central pennsylvania like penn state university you know and so it's it's not bad uh but it kind of felt like it was stuck in time and too clingy to previous events but yet it really didn't learn anything from any of those previous events uh, i feel like its history was actually holding it back from bigger and better things and that it should have learned some of those lessons. In some cases, it felt like we were being made to rehash crap that they should have learned in the first two movies and they're just making you watch them go through that process again and I didn't appreciate that. I still loved it, loved these characters, loved the setting, everything about it. It's just I I gave it, uh, I, I knocked a couple points off for that. Uh, I'm just confused as to how that ties into how Disney it is. How? What did you give it? Or is it more of just kind of a subjective? I didn't like what Disney did with this. It was it was more subjective. Okay. I didn't really like how Disney, you know, actually facilitated some they, of this they stuff. They could have gone with like Disney's Doug or like Disney's Gargoyles <laughs> where they sent them <laughs> mists of Avalon or whatever the hell. Yeah. No. Um, so you gave it a seven? I gave this a seven out of ten. I'm I'm more with Mel that like when I think Disney, it's Aladdin. And honestly, the movie and the animated series were kind of tied up together for me. So it's a nine for me. Okay. Cool. Uh, Mel, what do you have as a total for Aladdin? All right, so my Aladdin total is 27. Holy crap, that seems Jesus, low to that me. is so low. <laughs> <laughs> it's a failing grade, Disney. Well, I gave the theme song a three, if you I recall. I know, that's what happens when I, gave, when I gave Timon and Pumbaa yeah. one. Uh, Sean, what about you? Uh, I have Aladdin as a 36. 36, and for me, it's a 38, which brings us to a grand total of 33.7. So let me add that in real quick and see where we're at. Interesting. It's an interesting spot for that. Let's talk DuckTales. So first we're going to talk how Disney you think it is. So Mel, how Disney does this get for you? So to me, even though I just said Aladdin was Disney, <laughs> the, the, the Scrooge McDuck character and the three brothers, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and, and mm. Donald Duck, that's about as OG Disney as you get. And not only did they honor like the, the, the who those characters are, and they they had a lot of inspiration from their starting points. Then they really made it like it's an iconic animated series, and they didn't really have a movie that stood out. They don't need to because like to this day we all still remember what Ducktales is about and yep. who all those characters are. I gave it a ten out of ten because nice. this is about as like Disney animated series as you can possibly get. This is the classic. Nice, Sean. Uh, for the same reasons that Mel mentioned. I, you know, the the classic slapstick with Donald, that's classic Disney to me. Huey, Dewey, and Louie, I love the fact that they took some of their original design and they updated them slightly, uh, but it, it's still ultimately them at the core. Uh, Scrooge McDuck is a great character in this, and he's just wonderful. I could watch him be a dick to people all day long, and for some reason, that is Disney to me, but it's also intensely satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just, I mean, it it really is. It's, you know, the music in this is fantastic, and and just the action is is really comical, enjoyable. I loved the sense of adventure mm -hmm. in Ducktales, and for that, I gave it a ten out of ten. Hmm. See, I'm stuck at a nine, and I'm wondering why. I'm trying to I'm trying to rack my brain for why it's not just ten. If and you honestly, don't feel it on the inside, yeah, you don't have to feel it on the outside. You've given other things ten this month. And so it's one of those things that you give Aladdin a, a 10. And so if it didn't feel like it was at that point for you, it's subjective. Yeah, I backed off of that. Um, I don't know, though, but for how Disney it is, I don't know if I gave the edge to Gummy Bears because it felt more Disney to me. I think I'll stick with my 9. I think, I'll I think stick that's with my fine. Nine. That's okay. It's very Disney. It's about as Disney as you can get. That's okay. Um, if we had watched, I don't know, if we had watched some of the real OG stuff that they had turned into series, like a... 101 Dalmatians or like an early, early version of these guys, maybe more. I don't know why I went 101 Dalmatians. Yeah, I don't know why you did that either. I was like, that's a well, they, 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 made, they made 101 into an actual they, animated, like, serial no, I know. cartoon. Multiple I know, times. but... You just have to watch that, yeah. Yeah, yeah but... Dodge that bullet. Anyway, it's weird. So, dodge Mel, the, dodge that dog total. bullet. Dog bullets. My, t my total for DuckTales is 45. 45, nice. Sean? My total for DuckTales was 46. 46, nice. And I have a 41. And that's going to bring us to a 44. So obviously it wins tonight. And guess what, kids? I'm not going to tell you if it wins overall or not. Because it's time 
for the rundown. So let me just add this real quick and see what we got. All right. And that was a 44 average. Okay, anything else from uh, tonight's episode before we do uh, a rundown of the entire month of Disney March Madness? Winners and losers, medal earners, and go home with nothings, except maybe a t-shirt. Anything else from tonight's episode? No, this is a this was a <laughs> this was a challenging month, obviously yeah, for the for like the a, beginning like a marathon. You know, uh, when we every time we do these March Madness, uh, just because we double up with all these cartoons, it it, it always tends to be hard. You know, uh, it sometimes you know look we might miss something, and so if you if we have, please let us know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Please please tweet at us, drop us a line on Facebook, let us know what your scores are if you've been playing along at home. We appreciate it. I will say this. I'll say thanks to Mel for joining us again. We're going to have a, a moment with her still before we leave tonight. But uh, I will say the good news is none of the none of these shows were dipped. So we, yeah, that we didn't is hate anything so much that we erased it from existence. Uh, but you, we got, will... you got so close though, buddy. Yeah, real close. We'll talk about that in a second. We will have um, a chance to undip something coming up. We're still working on exactly how we want to do that. But we want to make that an annual event where anything that's been previously dipped may get a chance at redemption. Uh, a dip, a dip redemption, if a you dip, will. Dip dention. Dip dention. Dip, dip dention. Flockles. Uh, okay, so of the eight cartoons we talked about this month, there's got to be a loser, just as there's always a winner. Like I mentioned before, the ranking did not change. So Timon and Pumbaa, believe it or not, comes in uh, with an average of 29 points, oh. mostly thanks to me tanking them on the theme song score. <laughs> wow. This is even with the added points. They're at 29. Oh. They weirdly come in slightly somehow behind bonkers with a 29.5. These are, these are like failing grades still, by the way. <laughs> Ds get degrees with Quack Pack coming in at number six with an average of 32 points. Uh, Aladdin, tonight's Aladdin, comes in at number five, uh, just out of middle contention, 33.67 points. Wow. Now we get to the good stuff. Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers also misses out on a medal. 37 wow. and a third. 37 and a third. Wow. It's unfortunate, but it's good stuff. Goof Troop surprisingly takes the bronze tonight with an average of 41. That's acceptable. Bees get better degrees, from what I've been told. Here's This is close, actually. This is pretty close. Who do you think came in at number two? Gummy Bears. No. I thought it was... I think it's... I think it's... I think it's gummy bears. <laughs> it's gummy bears, yeah. <laughs> gummy bears. I don't know. I was second guessing myself. Because <laughs> I because I floated the question. Gummy you bears did. not enough bounce to get to that top spot with a total score of forty three and one third. And Ducktales takes it home with an average of forty four. Man, that that extra point. I think uh, I think I gave that extra point there. Mm. Did I take mm. one from Aladdin? Did I add an extra point? I can't even remember at this point. But Ducktales is the winner of Disney March Madness two thousand eighteen. <laughs> Congratulations, DuckTales. Woo. Woo. We're all too tired to celebrate. I'm pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I'm just yeah. like, oh, boy. Oh, man. But hey, those are just our opinions, right? And hey, guess what? You. Yeah, you listen. You've got a lot of opinions. And on occasion, you share them on the internet. We really, really wish you wouldn't sometimes. So to honor and talk about all of them, we are going to turn them over to longtime listener and friend of the show, Bobby Anthem, for this week's Love It or Hate It. Bobby Take it away with this week's Love It or Hate It for Aladdin. Our Love It for Aladdin was written by Ginger87 on August 29th, 2004. Ginger's post is titled, Brings Back Childhood Memories, and it says, Aladdin was one of my favorite TV shows when I was little. I was six years old when it premiered, and I remember waking up early Saturday mornings with my sister to watch this show, along with the Little Mermaid TV series. I love this show and I love the movie. I especially love the theme song of this show and my favorite character was Abu. He was so cute. My sister's favorite character was Jasmine. I also like the magic carpet and I used to wish I had one of my own. My favorite episode was The Secret of Dagger Rock. Overall, I really enjoyed this show when I was little and I still enjoy it now whenever I get a chance to watch it. I give this show 9 out of 10 stars. And our Hate It is titled Ugh, written by Megan Kumari on April 18th, 2003. She said, Take the movie Aladdin, kill Aladdin's personality, take away Robin Williams, mix bad animation with bad jokes, 
throw in boring plot lines, and basically you got Aladdin the TV series. I don't know what's worse, Aladdin the TV series or Tarzan the TV series, which is basically a ripoff of Aladdin. Do yourself a favor and watch Buzz Lightyear of Star Command instead. It's superior in every way. And now for our love it or hate it for DuckTales. Our DuckTales Love It was written by Action 6 on August 14th, 2000, in a post titled, Now This is a Classic Series. Action 6 said, DuckTales stands as one of my all-time favorites of Disney's TV series. I just love this series to bits. There are many cool episodes that I remember from the time it was broadcast over here in the early 1990s. Some of the episodes were a bit scary, too, but my favorite episode is the episode where Uncle Scrooge and his nephews go to Alaska to dig for gold. But I must also mention that some of the episodes could be a little cheesy and silly. The voices are also neat, and it makes you laugh many times because it can be a bit over the top. None of Disney's newer TV series managed to entertain in a way that DuckTales did. A classic that I will never forget. And our DuckTales Hate It is a WTF. The review was written by Lee Eisenberg on June 5th, 2010. Lee rated the show 5 out of 10 and titled the review, Connie Hines, R.I.P. It says, On December 18th last year, Connie Hines passed away. Who was she, you ask? She played Carol on Mr. Ed. What's that got to do with DuckTales? Quite simply, Alan Young, who played Wilbur, provided the voice of Scrooge McDuck, affecting a Scottish accent. So, this show of course portrayed tycoon Scrooge McDuck. How did he ever make all his money? And his nephews? The episode that I best remember is Earthquack, in which the characters discover that Duckburg's seismic activity is being caused by subterranean beings. The obvious problem with the show is its glamorization of wealth, making it look cool that Scrooge is a millionaire or billionaire. Like Mr. Howell on Gilligan's Island, it's never clear how much he's worth. Maybe DT isn't a terrible show, but it'll never be my favorite. I best remember Alan Young from Mr. Red, and I best remember that show for Connie Hines. She was, without a doubt, one of the most beautiful and gorgeous women who ever lived. You would think that there wouldn't be a hate it for DuckTales, or really Aladdin, but turns out, you'd be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> turns out, I gave that hate it for Aladdin. <gasps> you did. <laughs> You'll never I know. It was, it was abysmal. <laughs> Oh, God. It was Aminda Mula. Oh, I can't get enough of those. They're all uh, Mel's a bad. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's late. Parker Lewis can't lose, which is a joke many people make about my last name. Oh, that's Man. awful. I apologize. But thank you so much for joining us for yes, tonight's thank super you. special episode. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. What are you up to in the next couple of weeks if you want the folks out there to find out? Uh, and where can they find you on social media if you are so inclined? I don't want you to find me in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Tell so them the fuck off. Just don't come looking for me. I'll be <laughs> unfindable. Private citizen. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can always find me on the internet. Um, <laughs> well. <laughs> on Twitter, where I'm retweeting Saturday morning cartoons and... Other such nonsense, uh, at Melanie Gwynn, that's G-W-Y-N-N-E, or at Twitter, Melanie underscore Gwynn. It's Welsh. Come can find just, me. Can that just be your new handle? Is that available? No, it's Welsh. no, it's Welsh. but I might make it my Twitter thing because I, I had to get rid of it because I think I just had a yes for the longest time, like mm. since I joined Twitter, and then I realized I had to say something meaningful. like it meaningful, so then yeah. I changed it recently. Um, but I think I might change it back to, maybe I'll just say like it's Welsh. I'm still a jovial cartoonist because that's what a CNN news article labeled me as <laughs> during the Atlanta power outage at the uh, airport. Which was for, for reasons alone, I'm glad that I have a Google alert based on your name, Dave. <laughs> Damn it. 
Sean, buddy, what are you up to in the next couple of weeks? Guys, as always, I do live improv comedy in Washington, D.C. with a group that is called Knox. That's N-O-X exclamation point. We perform with Washington Improv Theater. You can find tickets and times, witdc.org. And I'm always on the Instas and the Turs and the Instaturs at Sean Paul Ellis. Instaturs? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, they one bought out the other and they've made it's like a... like a flockle. Yeah, move. Yeah, pretty Woo! much. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, as for me, you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Claw MD. I look for jovial cartoonist Dave Trumbor. It's the same thing. Uh, you can also find me on Collider.com, Nerdist.com, and Dave Trumbor.com. If you want to find out more about this little show right here, hey, guess what? I'll keep it simple tonight. Just go to patreon.com slash Saturday morning cartoons. You'll find pretty much everything you want to find there. Uh, if you want to keep the conversation going, though, you can head on over to our Facebook page or follow along on Twitter at Morning Tunes. That's going to do it for tonight and for March Madness 2018. I feel like it's going to be a real long time before we do any kind of themed month ever again. Couldn't possibly do another theme month. Don't have it in us. Probably. We do theme months every month. Every yeah, month. yeah you guys are month. really pretty predictable. I yeah, don't but know at least, why we do this to ourselves. At least for this theme month that we have that's coming up, we have a, an incredible reason to celebrate. Yeah. Which is super exciting. We do. What is it? We have our 200th episode that is what? going to be coming out. We're uh, talking nothing but hentai. <laughs> <laughs> People are going to be so disappointed. They are going to be <laughs> really letting it, the internet down right now. All right, guys. Episode 500. All hentai uh, spectacular. All hentai spectacular. I mean, like, you know what? I'll, I'll say Live this. Live studio audience. I'll say this. If you pick it, I will, I will watch it and comment on it. <laughs> Fuck, who knows what kind of stuff's going to be out there by the time we get to <laughs> yeah, episode 500. Right. Oh, no. <laughs> We'd love to tell you what's coming up for episode 200. And for April, here's a here's a guess. It's alliterative. alliterative. That helps you at all. I'm alliterate. The month is alliterative. Uh, but we can't unless you sign up for our newsletter, which you can also do at patreon.com. So there's your tease. But for everybody here at Saturday Morning Cartoons, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Mel, for joining us again. Thanks, yes. Sean, for being you. We will see you guys next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out.